para el abuelo, para la abuela, para toda la gente que quiere bailar. Uh -huh. I can see her, her guest dancing in there. Oh, baby, let's She's feeling the rhythm. <laughs> it's happened lately with this song. I don't know if there's there's something in this song. Uh, 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 mute. Mute, mute. There we go. I know this song. He, give us the jellies. Gives us the jellies. The jelly. <laughs> I am ready to go. All right, Fonzie, you ready to go? What's up, beautiful people? Happy Wednesday, happy hump day. Oh, Times yeah. Two. Wow, it's been a Five content full day. Content day today. We had oh, little, yes, little teas in the morning, and then now this. Wow. I know. We're so, I'm so excited. Today yeah. we have a legend in the house. I know. I'm so excited. <gasps> so I don't excited. know. I don't know if you guys will be able to see him because he's like really good, you know, like in the show. Wow, bad joke. I was about to Yeah, stop bro. Bad, bad you, joke. you are not a dad here, okay? Dad jokes, leave him to me. Okay. You guys will understand said, what I'm talking about yes. in just a second. In just a second? Okay. Should we? Okay. Should we go there? Where? I don't know. Are you awake? Yes. Okay, this I don't, morning. I don't know what you're talking about. Second. Okay. I, I I just know I'm ready to get started. I am <laughs> pumped up. <laughs> All right. Say the lead. Good. There we go. All right. I got my, go. my cheat sheet right here. Cheat sheet? Do you need a cheat sheet still? I don't. Ah. 130 episodes. I think I already know the intro <laughs> at heart. <laughs> Let's make this happen. We've got some hey, I'm Luis. And I'm so Luis. Nice You're so listening you to the Content is Profit podcast. Cast. And we spent the last four years learning the strategies and techniques from some of the top marketers in the world on how to create content that turns into profit. If you'd like to learn how to turn that content into profit, just go to contentsprofit.com. There's a small surprise in there for you. Go oh, take it. yeah. And okay. today, legendary guest and legendary topic. How to hey, solve babe. problems and drive revenue like a ninja. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> wow. Behind camera, you were trying to make a joke. I think, that, I you know, know, for those watching related, the live yes. behind the scenes, but they will hopefully understand. Uh, before we get started, Fonzie, do we have a sponsor today? Whoa, thank you for asking. And indeed, You're welcome. we do. Say what? Today's sponsor is your own, The Biz Bros. What? Let's go. We sponsor so. our own episodes. <laughs> and today's sponsor so is the program Content yeah. Momentum. That's right. And you might be asking yourself, what is that? Well, if you produce a long form piece of content just like this one that you're listening to or watching and you want to turn it yeah. into value packed by size assets so then you can send the them like sound. little minions yes. into social media to amplify your contribution and get yourself some new clients then we want to help you out That's please right, slide into the dms at Beast Bros Co on facebook on instagram whatever you want yeah we are in there don't forget to subscribe. Hit smash that subscribe button so you know when those episodes are on your phone every Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And don't forget to follow us on social media at BizForceGo, like Fonzie just mentioned. That is right. And mm. if you find this episode impactful, please, or only ask, is for you to share with somebody. We never know who we can impact, whose life we can change with today's message and today's That's guest. Right. So That's please, right. please, please share it and... And don't forget to give us a five star review. Thank oh, you. Oh, so beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Legendary guest alert. Today we have e commerce royalty in the content is profit house. We first connected with him on Clubhouse and we managed to get him on the show thanks to the one and only Bart Miller. Episode 56. Go check him out. That is true. We all should have worn a hat, a cowboy hat, <laughs> in today's honor just for Bart. Either way, today's guest is a business catalyst. He mm. is one of those entrepreneurs that move fast. And it's lethal. And he does. <laughs> and what he does, we yes. can even say he is a ninja. <laughs> uh, I see. I see what you did there, Fonse. Good, good stuff. Okay. And you're right. Today's guest has built 176 new Shopify sites in nine months. And he has a radio show since 2011, in which he has interviewed entrepreneurs such as Tim Ferriss and Neil Patel. Not to mention that he is a record holder on what? I have no idea. We'll definitely have to ask him as soon as we start the show. I know. I'm so. <laughs> And I don't think it's so epic that he had, you know, Tim Ferriss, Neil oh, Patel, yes. and he's been publishing since 2011. Whew. How epic is that? I'm so pumped up. Yeah. Please welcome host of the Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio, hmm. amazing father of four, and the Biz Ninja himself, Tyler Jorgerson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving the hype, man. This is amazing. Killing Let's it. Let's go. <laughs> 
Dude, Tyler, Tyler, I was afraid we weren't going to be able to find you. We were hiding in the shadows like a ninja or something like that, you know? But he, He's still working that joke. Out. Yeah. I, I know. It, I mean, is that joke worth it, Tyler? I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting. I started using the biz ninja term uh, back in 2011 when I started that sh when I started my radio show. And I feel like since then, everyone's become like they've really used the ninja term. <laughs> so we still we still hang on to it. We're still one of the one of the early ninjas. Uh, uh, I love it. That's I know. Pretty cool. Uh, but, you know, like I actually Googled it up. I put define ninja in Google and the informal definition is a person who excels in a particular skill or activity. Mm. You know, it makes total sense, Tyler, after looking at your story and all the things that you have done and created. You are definitely a ninja, man. You are a, a contemporary ninja, I guess. <laughs> contemporary ninja, I like that. Yes, <laughs> Dude, Tyler. Uh, since uh, uh, you know, I was not familiar with with your show, with your radio show. You've had amazing people in there. Uh, Alex Ormosi, personal favorite interview. So you know, there's amazing, amazing stuff in there. And obviously, we'll dive into your show. But for those who don't know you, do you want to give us a little bit of your backstory? Like, how did this like the publishing start? Like, what are you doing with Shopify and just like making amazing, creating amazing momentum, right? With with the people that you yeah. help. So I've, I've really been an entrepreneur since I was a kid, like five years old, all my I, all the neighborhood kids got allowance. I didn't get allowance, but I still wanted to go to the corner store and buy sweets, right? Like, mm -hmm. so I, I realized there's a first problem. I got, if I want sweets, I need money. Let's figure it out. So I pick flowers from the old lady around the corner. I'd pick them from her front yard. I'd wrap them up in a little bouquet and I'd sell them to her, right? So they were her own flowers. But it was like the beginning, like even at five years old, I realized if there's something that you want, you can whine about it or you can find some kind of a solution. And then, you know, it, it, 12 years old, I started, you know, I had a paper route for years. And then I, uh, I launched my first legal business when I was 18 years old. And then 22, I bought a restaurant. And then, you know, by 25, I owned a mortgage company. And I just, I was always looking for that next thing. So when it, the economy crashed in like 2008, 2010 timeframe. I got into e-commerce because of the book, The 4-Hour Workweek. And I built a business that would be able to really run without me for the most part and really have the 4-Hour Workweek lifestyle. And I realized when I did that, that I loved the idea of creating something and launching it. That's my favorite part. Yeah. So now I come into other businesses and, and help them really get that catalyst, that big, big leap of momentum. Wow. That, I, I love the, the timestamps on the story. <laughs> and let me tell I, I do have a, a very specific question about this. Did the lady knew it was her flowers, the ones that you were selling to her? Absolutely. And she was a repeat customer until I uh, moved out of the area eight years later. Uh, wow. How, how amazing. I love how, you know, how supportive the community can be in those aspects when they see a kid, someone, yeah. you know, trying to be resourceful at the end of the day, you're like, how can I solve my problem of getting candy? And then you started doing it. Yeah. I I'm curious. It, it was nice. It, got, it came to a point where I would show up and I didn't have to sell her something. She would just give me candy or sweets or, you know, cookies <laughs> or something. Right. So yeah, that. wow. That's yeah. amazing. The, the were, your, were your parents entrepreneurs as well? No, but my, my dad is entrepreneurial, like minded. Um, but I think I have a, an, a, much different or more aggressive risk appetite, right? I'm willing to be like, I'm overly comfortable with risk where I think some people who have the ideas of being self-employed or being an entrepreneur, they're not ready to take that level of risk. It's pretty, you've got to be real willing to go to the bottom. Yeah. So, okay. So on the risk side of things, right? Like, um, have you always been like that? Because, you know, I relate with your story on, on the candy side of things for us with soccer jerseys, like we will go to this market. Yeah and we'll buy the shirts, let's say five bucks, and then we'll go to our school. And they, they were counterfeit shirts. They looked exactly the same, but then our friends will pay 25 bucks. And the original version was 60 bucks, right? So mm -hmm. it was a win-win for everybody, right? So I relay with that. But, uh, <laughs> not for everybody. Well, it, Adidas and Nike, they weren't not very for Adidas, that. right? Adidas and Nike, not so much. <laughs> okay, so, sorry, Adidas. Sorry, Nike. Everybody uh, involved. It was a win for everybody, everybody involved. involved. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Th thank you guys for, uh, you know, putting me in my place. Anyways, but I, I relate with that, right? Because he came out of the need because our parents weren't like, we're not giving you money go figure it out right uh, and that was the solution and then we sold also like these cds with uh mixed music we will burn the cd and like sell in store with the mixes and stuff like that so yeah. i relate with that side of things but risk 
in on our case, or at least in my case, I don't know, fancy, but it has never been that thing because for us, the North was always soccer. And then we kind of took those at the athlete side of things. We were D1 soccer players and, and we were in Europe as well. And now we kind of brought some of that into the entrepreneurial journey in the last five years. But race was never like I was always kind of scared of it. Right. Like for you, were you always like, let's let's do it. Right. I don't I don't really you know, what, what was your journey? So, yeah, I think that's a really good question. So I, I'm a I'm a family man. I've got four kids and a family. And so risk is different, I think, at different stages of life. So, um, you know, when I was 18 and I started my first retail company selling snowboards, it was really moderate risk. I, it wasn't aggressive risk. I, I would, uh, you know, I had a list of suppliers and the, somebody would pick out their first choice and second choice. Then I would go to my supplier and buy it. I, I floated the, the client's money, really, really low risk, right? Yeah. Um, as, as companies get bigger, the risk increases, but I, I'm still very like, I'm, oh, I'm open to risk. I'm willing to do it, but I'm not blind, right? Like I'm not going to take the big thing I learned from 2000, like the great recession is like, I, I need to have a, a war chest because even if I'm willing to take risk, like I've got a team of 20 people, I'm not going to risk their stuff. I'm not going to risk their livelihoods. Right. So I've got to be able to communicate in advance to them. And I mean, risk doesn't always pay out. I mean, I got I got hammered in the recession. It was a horrible time. Yeah. Um, and so you, but but at the same time, like I knew, as hard as that was, that there was another opportunity that could take me out yeah. of it, right? Yeah. And so, I think for me, it, the, the, it's mitigating risk, but then just realizing we we don't have one opportunity. We don't have one like we're like the anti M and M, right? We don't have one shot, one opportunity, right? We <laughs> There's a lot of things coming our way and it really comes down to like, okay, that one didn't work or, or I did that one wrong and it didn't, I didn't get the results I wanted. Learn and move to the next thing. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love that first. I'm going to start using the anti M&M. Um, I don't know if I said his name right. I say M&M like the chocolates. But we all know we're talking about the rapper here. Uh, don't worry, Tyler. I will definitely, definitely say I learned, learned that from you. But from that way you just heard with us, I have two specific questions, right? The first one is, in your eyes, what is aggressive risk, right, for for entrepreneurs? Uh, whether should they avoid it? Obviously, it depends. It's a little subjective, I feel, on, on people's situation. And, and, you know, for example, I don't have a family of my own. I don't have kids like my brother. Um, so probably yeah, I'm, your, I, I'm your family. <laughs> so probably okay, I could take a little bit of more risk, right, on that side. And then sure. the other one is, how do you that that mindset on looking on opportunities? How do you keep your eyes open and instead of folk, you know, so I, I feel like a lot of people just yeah. go on like this is my path. Like I can only do this instead of where are the problems that I can probably solve and help people in here. So there's a couple of things to unpack there. And I think one of them is um, like, how do you pursue opportunities? And, you know, you mentioned Alex Ramosi earlier. He's a, a friend of mine and he and I were talking once. And right before he launched, he really leaned in hard to gym launch and what he's doing now. And he, we were talking about the concept that it takes the same amount of energy to pursue a level 10 opportunity as it does to pursue like a level two or three opportunity. So like you might as well be picky about which one you're going to go all in on. Yeah. Um, and so, but, but also like that might be predicated upon how much risk you can, you can stomach. So like at the time, he, he and Layla weren't married. He didn't have kids. Like he could take a le higher level of risk than I could take as a father of four who, yeah. you know, had different, different things. Now it doesn't mean that's not an excuse to not play big, but it yeah. means we're playing with a different deck. Right. And that's okay. We have different hands to play. So, yeah. you know, he was able to lean, go completely all in where like what I have is I'm like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to play pretty aggressive on like a level five opportunity, get that to a point of stability. And then like have that put that on autopilot and go chase level 10, right? And that's just because I'm not willing to go back to like, I'll go to zero, but I won't put, I won't put my, my family to zero ever again. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I relate. And thank you for that. Right. Because, you know, uh, 
when we first started the business, it, it was obviously the two of us and we did uh, stickers and then we did screen printing t-shirts and then it evolved to social media and then video production. And now we do all this stuff with content and, and it's been all fun, right? But I remember about a year ago or like September 2019, it was the first time that we made a very big investment for us, right? I, I took very, basically a $40,000 personal loan to quit my job so we could do this full time at the time, right? My wife definitely agreed with that, which is awesome. I, I thank you, Kate. And then, but then we went to this event and we hired our first coach ever for 25 grand. So that chopped my, my loan for half. Yeah. And Katie did not know this about like almost like two months ago. Right. So she's like, thank God it all worked out. Right. But, but that was my risk. Right. And, and I remember it like it was a really challenging decision to make at the time because first we didn't have the cash, we didn't have the cash flow, but that coach was exactly what we needed to move things to the next level. Right. So. Yeah. Uh, is there a framework that you you might use to assess different opportunities? Uh, for us, was literally like we in, deep in ourselves we knew that was the path that we needed to take for X amount of reasons. Like we were very indoctrinated in what they did. Like we were getting results at some level, and we're like, that's exactly what we need. But is there a framework that you might follow? We're like, hey, I spotted an opportunity, level three, level five, level six. Should I run it through this framework? If it you know comes out great, I take it. Or is it just yeah. I feel like. Yeah, I mean, a little bit of a framework. I think what's like when you're referring to like whether or not to work with a coach or whether or not who to hire, I don't look at those as necessarily business opportunities as much as just strategic moves within the opportunity, right? Your opportunity was the business that you're pursuing, right? And, the, and then you had this strategic decisions of how to move within that. So for me, like the opportunity of what type of business or what type of thing to pursue, um, it comes down to a couple of factors. Like one, is it already in your wheelhouse, right? So if somebody is trying to make the move from employee to self-employed or from self-employed to business owner, right? If they're trying to make that shift, you have to say like, do I have the skills to run this as a business instead yeah. of as a job? Because they're not the same thing. You could be a phenomenal graphic designer. It doesn't mean you should own a graphic design company unless you have the stomach to be the, like really you have to then start leaving the graphic design. Right. And saying, okay, I'm going to hire people to do that if you're truly going to be a business owner. So mm -hmm. kind of like step one is, do you have the, do you have the, the chops to do the, the job or the business you're trying to mm -hmm. pursue? And if you don't, then, okay, like, are, are you going to hire that? Or are you going to partner that? Right. Do you have the resource to either go hire those expertise or go, you know, or, or just bring partners in? And I, I don't think you should ever bring a partner in that is someone that you could have just paid and hired right? The, the partner should be someone that fills a higher level need than just a task. It should be like, I need this to have a balance in my, in, in a higher level resources. So kind of chipping away at that and coming back to the last thing, I think step one in that framework of like, how do I choose which opportunity is just realize two things. There's not just one opportunity and it's okay to pursue an opportunity and then abandon it. So like, I'm, I'm a big believer of like, start, just don't waste time in getting the first like brick laid of, in down the road, right? Just yeah. get it started, but then be super honest with yourself and maybe set up like several gates. Like, okay, I'm going to pursue this up until I get my first sale. And then I'm going to reevaluate if I'm enjoying it. Cause you may not, you, you may realize like, oh, this was a grass is greener situation. I don't actually enjoy this business. Yeah. Uh, and then another one would be like, okay, so typically what we do in e-commerce is we say, the first gate is the first sale. That's not your mom or your sister or your friend, right? Like the first stranger that buys from you, then getting to a thousand dollars a day in sales. And then, you know, then getting to like a hundred grand, like six figures plus a month. Beyond that, it comes down to just how aggressive you're going to be. So each of those gates, like it's also okay to look back on the business and say, does this suck? Like, do I like this? Yeah. So, and that can either be a shift of the business or a shift of how you're running it. And yeah. so, to me, like just keeping the mindset is like, there's not just one opportunity. There's not just one business, one e-com store, one, one, you know, podcast topic, whatever. There's countless. Yeah. That, that's the first framework. I, I, I love the, the pivoting mindset and, you know, the fact that someone with such an experience is sharing openly about, hey, it's okay to pivot. Because I feel like so many people just get stuck into, you know, hammering that opportunity, even if like nothing's in there. And then they just get drained and, and they don't get anywhere, right? And at the end, they just want to either quit 
or not even pivot. It's like either totally <laughs> quit or just keep at it until it, it magically works. And yeah. that can, I, I'm curious now because in here in the intro, we said, right, that you have, you have built over 170 Shopify stores in the last nine months. Have, have those been part of a pivoting, uh, I guess, a strategy for, y for you? Has, a, has those been for clients? I'm extremely curious yeah. now. Yeah, that that specific project was something that I, I worked on with a, with a team for an investment firm. And so my job in that was to come up with the idea, the domain, the branding, the build out, and then the first batch of products. And then I'd hand it over to our, our marketing team. Um, I, I have done a lot of other more, a lot more than that number of stores for other yeah. clients and, and other things. Um, and then I've also like, I've sold five of my own brands and I'm, and I'm constantly looking at new ones to launch. And so right now, like what I did for the last year is I said, hey, I'm not going to launch anything. We're going to focus on our agency where we, where we help other people scale their e-com brands. Yeah. For all of 2020, 2021, we'll start looking at opportunities again. So I'm right at this point where we're starting to evaluate, okay, I yeah. could pursue this product and brand, or I could maybe do this one, or maybe, you know what, neither of these are big enough play. We'll just wait, like no rush. Yeah. But, uh, you know. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, no, definitely. I, and I, I see a pattern in there that can be useful for people, right? And, and we often talk about this with content is do the content at first, right? Put it out there. That's the most important part. And then you can go back, revisit, reflect on that content, learn from it, right? If you didn't feel good doing it, right? If you think you failed, and I'm doing air quotes in here, we call them <laughs> samples, right? You yeah. can actually learn from it and then do another piece of content and, and it's a cycle and it's the same cycle I'm, I'm, I'm seeing right now with your business, right? You're like, okay, we were doing this, right? We reflected, we're like, no, let's transition into agency. And now in 2021, it's like, okay, we did it. Let's reflect again. Where is the next part? So I think it's like a constant, you know, a constant circle or that where we're going about executing, learn, reflecting, learning, and then executing again. And we just go and go all over. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. <laughs> no, I like it. I like it. No, in my in my head, I'm going. So, Tyler, like, so you know where my head is at. Like, the last probably three weeks has been around framework, right? Because mm -hmm. we we on ourselves, like, what we execute for our clients and what we do for us and for the show, it's a framework on how we thought the content should be produced because we didn't have time, right? Like, to execute to the point that you know when we first started selling it about two years ago, uh, we had a, a meeting with a bunch of business owners and they're like, "Where's your stuff?" Right? And we're like, "Ah." Like, like gut punch, right? And right now I would say, you know, you know, athletic uh, was a uh, Olympic medalist, right? That they have their coaches, and we can execute for you, and here are the results. But that comment like felt really real at the time because I, I wasn't doing it, right? Like I, I didn't feel like I, I had the the the, the, the the experience and the confidence to to potentially do that, right? So that's sure. why this started, like after COVID stuff and before that, and and there's that system. So lately, the the word framework has been like, I'm the operator. If you haven't re realized by that yet, by that yet, like I'm the integrator. Is that what it is? Sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm I'm the dreamer. Fancy the dreamer, right? Here. So it's like he yeah. he go, comes up with the awesome ideas, and then I'm like, okay, how can we execute this consistently, right, with the team or ourselves, or what how, what what's the thing, right? So has that for like on the framework side for you? like on your show or on your business, I see there's a pattern there. Do you Did you identify that from the very beginning or how was your experience learning that lesson if you actually learned that lesson uh, or was it just natural to you? <laughs> and are you talking about kind of that general like feedback loop that we're just exactly. talking about? That framework? Sure. Um, I think it came from my desire to all, like I, so I love starting. And for mm. a long time, I thought like, oh, like I need to go fix this weakness of that I'm not as good at running, mm. right? I, I'm not as good at building things like, you know, so I'm really good at taking a business to like the first million dollars, right? Mm. Zero to 100 grand a month. That, that's my sweet spot. Or some, if a business is stuck at like 30, 40, 50, okay, like how, how can we move it fast? And I've, and I've worked in a lot of industries. And so I, there's not many industries I can't help make that solution. Mm -hmm. And I used to see it as a weakness. And then I finally just said, you know what? No, like that's actually like my superpowers. There's so many people that suck at starting. Mm. They can't even get that they're like, they'll be talking about starting an e-com store for years. And I'm like, How, you should have tried like five by now, but they can't <laughs> even start. Yeah, so for yeah. like really like that, that framework came in from me just accepting where my strengths are. So like you recognizing you're, you're an implementer and you're a dreamer, like 
and, and being okay that you don't have every strength. That was the biggest thing for me. Like, yeah. I'm like, no, I'm good at starting. So I'm going to hire an implementer and I'm going to hire an operations person. I'm going to hire and I'm going to bring a team around me so yeah. I can do what, I, do what I'm good at. I love just relationships. I love connecting. I love starting. I love having the ideas. And then, you know, if, and if the team gets stuck, I'm really good about, okay, we, here's how we're going to get unstuck. But then I'm going to trust them to do their job and just get, get you know, get the stuff done. Yeah. So it's not a framework of complexity. It's a framework of simplicity of like nice. lean into what you're good at and be willing to change, like be willing uh-huh. to pivot. So I, I love this. It, it actually reminds me of a story we heard about Zero 0800 got junk. I don't know if you know about the company. I think yep. the, one of the operators in that company, he um, these numbers, I don't, I don't remember the exact numbers, but let's say he grew the company from like 50 million to 100 million, and then he couldn't scale it past that. And they had to bring someone new. So the guy gave a talk where he was like, I was okay with it. Because I knew that was my power. Like, yep. I, that is where I work the best is when I grab companies in like the 50 million range yeah. and I can take them to nine figures. And then they need somebody else that can do nine figures and above, right? They're so, all different skills for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I love you sharing this because I, in a, in a sense, I feel like for me, that was eye opening because I always thought, if you have a business, you are, you know, you ride it till you die, pretty much. Like you grow it until the end. And now I'm like, it is not like that, right? Like kind of like gives me permission on, you know, perform where your strengths are. And then it's okay to hand it over to someone that is way better than you at that other yeah. step of the process. I yeah, mean, and there's there's more and more. Oh, go ahead, Luis. No, no. Well, I, I was just gonna mention it. Just brings an immense amount of clarity, right? Like, uh, and you know, when when you're starting up, you might not have that clarity, right? You might have to try different things to see what you like, what what works, right? Like that. That's what we did with the agency at first. It was like probably nine different services, and then the feedback came back to the content side of things, right? And then within the content, the type of content that we do, right? So, but it, it started like that. And then once you accept that, you're like, oh, like it's, I'm at peace with myself. I have massive clarity who I help, right? And then it's so easy to have that conversation now because there's no going to be any friction inside of me. Hence, you know, the conversation is going to be great. So I just want to add that comment in there. Continue, Tyler, please. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think... It's funny how often it comes down to just realizing a lot of the conversations we've had today come back to how a lot of times we we want to apply the way that like the normal business world does things, right? So the normal career path, the normal like get a job, work in that job, work up the ladder, right? But if you're going to be an entrepreneur, if you're going to be a business owner, you don't, it's different. And yeah. And the other way isn't bad. Right, we need people to fill roles and do those things and thrive in that in that position. But if you're going to be an innovator, if you're going to be a creator, you've got to realize like you don't fit that mold. So stop applying those things over into your life. So it's like, okay, you you grew a company and now you might realize you hate being a CEO or you hate being uh, you know the 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 face of the company. Right? There's no rule book like. Just do what makes you feel most comfortable, like remove the friction points, remove the things, lean into momentum and do it the way that works best for you. If that means, hey, I'm not going to be, I'm going to step out. I'm going to be the chairman of the board now of this company that I've built and I'm going to let somebody else run it on the day to day. Cool. There's no, do whatever makes sense, do whatever fits. And then if that doesn't work, change it again. Because again, you don't have to stay married to one idea. Yeah. You just said... Three of our favorite words. <laughs> Remove the friction. We, we love those. I mean, you know, those Smooth are... Smooth operator. <laughs> yeah, th- those are so tied up to our story because yeah. of when we wanted to start publishing. Since we used to do videos for events and we have some of the equipment and we were used to watching, you know, these awesomely produced YouTube videos. When we started, we're like, we need to look like that. We n- Let's add as much friction as we can <laughs> before we actually publish anything. So we never got anything done. And it got to a day that we're like, okay, let's, we, we created an internal challenge, 45 Live, which shameless plug, we are doing it for everybody that wants to join. We start, we're going to start February 8th, where we went 45 days in a row, right, publishing. But the, re- the, the way to do it was to remove the friction. So we just went for 
Facebook Live for 45 days in a row. It was as simple as that, well, right? So, well, well, hold on. Okay, okay. Fact check. I, I, so, I so hold on, hold on. No, so let's take a, a special time out for a word from our sponsors. Where does somebody <laughs> go to learn about, about your 45-day challenge? <laughs> yes, like slide into DMs, at Base Roscoe on Instagram. Uh, you can go to go45.live, I believe, Fonsi, right? Is that, it's, is that, it's, it's not on yet. It's not on yet, yeah, but yeah. it will be. So here, so, here's... Here's a quick parenthesis on that story. We're, right? do, we're doing literally the just start. The, we're, the yeah. just start on that because <laughs> Good. We've, we've shared this story so many times and people have been resonating because that's the thing. Like a lot of uh, people add a lot of unnecessary friction at the very beginning before they start, right? There is a reason, Tyler, we do the show live. And I don't think we, we've chatted about this, but the reason we do it live is so we can be accountable <laughs> for doing it. And we're like, we have to do it. We told people that we were going to do it, so we have to do it, right? And so that's the reason yeah. we've done more than 140 episodes by now is because of that reason. And starting 45 Live, and the reason I, I scream fat check to Fonzie is because we said 45 days, but guess what? Guess how long we lasted? Like, this is a cool question. This is a good question. <laughs> so you're supposed to do it every day for 45 days? Yeah. Yes. How long did you last? I don't know. <laughs> we lasted 15 135. 15 days. <laughs> thank you. I, you have been the most optimistic answer out yeah, there in the world. Some so people thank say you. like three days. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it, it comes also, I understand where that is coming from because you are consistent with your content, right? Like you are more than 300 episodes in, you do it like every, almost every single day, right? You're out there sharing your message. Mm -hmm. For us, it was 15 days, but because we got results, we actually got like a massive sell out of it through a connection. And then we were implementing and then we told ourselves yeah. that we were easy to not do it. And then we did season two. And that's why the story kind of resonates. And now we're doing season yeah. three and, and see what's up and people are joining. And it's it's going to be incredible. So thank you for allowing us to shameless plug this story. <laughs> but to the point Your is, show. It, it's about, <laughs> it's about the, the consistency, right? Moving forward and removing that friction so, so we can execute. And I think that's perfect transition, unless Fonsi has another very smart question. Well, but, the, the, so I did want to make that transition into the content side of things yeah. with like removing the friction. It's like we're brothers. Maybe, okay. maybe, who knows? Okay. But, you, you know, Ty, I'm curious, because at the beginning you said that in, I think it was 2010, that you read the four-hour work week, and that's how you transition into the e-commerce space. And I know you've had Tim Ferriss in your show, which is absolutely amazing too. But I'm curious, you know, what was it? What made you start the, the podcast itself? Because you started the podcast in 2011, right? So when you were yeah. starting this journey as well. So it's a super weird story of how I started. So again, I, I'm actually like my show starts on the radio, it actually plays on old school AM radio, and then it goes to podcasts and everything else, right? Awesome. So. Yeah. Um, I had I had followed the four hour work week. I'd launched my first uh, e commerce store. It had it was taking off. It had replaced my income and was scaling and all kinds of stuff. So I uh, one of the things that Tim Ferriss does is say like in, in the four hour work week he goes through like hey here's how to get more media, you know contact radio stations and television and see if you can buy remnant like un like unsold inventory at the last minute. Yeah. So I'm like, cool, I'll just call up all the local stations and see if I can get it. And so I ended up getting on the on the phone with um, the owner of one of the local stations. And I, he, I told him what I was looking for and he started asking questions. And he's like, man, this is amazing. Like, this is really a cool story. You should come into the station. And so he like threw me on somebody else's show as a guest. <laughs> the next week I was live on air with my own show. And it was just like, it was really just this weird, in hindsight, I don't know how it happened. It was probably just like me, I was in a yes mood. Yeah, that sounds cool. <laughs> yes. We should totally, we should totally do that. And I, I remember I, I printed out like a year's worth of my blogs just to like have topics to talk about because it was live radio, <laughs> you know, I have to be ready. And then, um, and so it's, I'm going and it's live and then it turned into a segmented show that became really awesome. I. I would start with like a 10 minute kind of welcome motivational moment, share, share a cool story of that about entrepreneurship. Then I would have two interviews of entrepreneurs and, uh, and then it would, and then I do a wrap up and I'd have commercial breaks in between as a full hour live radio show. Now I do it as a 28 minute pre-recorded show. It's a lot easier, just one guest, but, uh, man, I, I got it. I've, I've been able to meet so many amazing people because of the show. And that was, mm -hmm. that was really what kept me doing it was the connectivity I have not done as good of a job on content as I could. Uh, and that is something we're leaning into here going into 2021. Because again, the primary reason I did it was just to, it was, it was healthy just to share and yeah. connect. And now I'm like, okay, now we need to amplify.
Yeah, um, absolutely. This is probably one of my favorite stories on how a podcast start. And and we talk, yeah. we say podcast because obviously the audio it goes is. there. But it, it but it's a podcast now too. Yeah, but it, but it's a it's a platform, right? At the end of the day, it's a platform. Like we we call this our thing show, and we were actually looking into radio about three weeks ago. And and I want to distill some of the information that you shared, right? Like you you started yeah. reaching out, and a lot of people are like, how do I how do I do reach out, call, ask the people that that are there, like what's the, what's the way, right? And we literally called in a radio producer that works uh, probably three offices down, the, and we're like, uh, Gary, how do we actually get on radio? Can we get this show on the radio? Right? Let's see, and. Uh, you say a radio show that creates leverage. You're like, oh wow, that sparks an interest. You're different, right? And that and it that's is, it thing. is nice to say like I, I'm I'm on ABC News, right? And so that's that's yeah. a credibility indicator. It's cool for my guests. I can say, hey, you're, you've now been featured on ABC News, like legitimately, not just throwing the picture on your website and pretending. <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> oh, wow. it's, it's so good. Uh, ah, so 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 many exciting thoughts here, because. Uh, Literally, I just jumped off a phone call with somebody that does uh, recruiting for for a lot of companies, right? And they're like, we're trying to get this world out and create conversations. I'm like, you need a platform. Just create a platform. Uh, it could be a Zoom call where you distribute. Yeah. That's, you could distribute anywhere, right? But and, it, it, Yeah, and I think, I think that's what I missed the most at the beginning was really understanding how I should have been leveraged. And what's funny is like I do this for other people, but just – Again, I should have been leveraging it, really pushing like, okay, having calls to action in the show, driving them into opt-ins, building an email list. And, uh, but the plot, but just having the platform has opened ridiculous number of doors for me. Like, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah you, it's insane. You are being incredibly humble with this. I just want to <laughs> say that you got it done, man. Like that's the most important thing. And the relationships that you probably have been able to build because of that just like for us in this past like 10 months have been incredible so yeah I, the, the, I, for example for us tyler there has been a clear before and after the podcast like before we were literally just struggling with not even with our offer we didn't know exactly what we wanted to offer we were all over the place we didn't feel that i personally didn't feel that comfortable you know talking to to people getting to know people and the fact of having the everything and it is it is a clear after because after we got the platform is when we finally started implementing and focusing not only on the service side but on but building the relationships right and these relationships have been the ones that have allowed us to scale in a sense right and and gather new eyeballs if you want to put it that way yeah. new attention i mean yeah. we have you right here today thanks to bart miller right that we managed to have on the podcast before he was like episode what was it 56 and we had bart miller because we connected with someone before that <laughs> introduced us to bart so it's incredible what could happen if you if yeah. you have a platform and, and leverage those relationships for the first two years of my show one of the main ways that i would get guests is i would say what am i trying to learn in my business and then i would put out a thing saying hey i'm looking for experts in what I, what tyler <laughs> needs to learn <laughs> Yes. And then I would have those people come on the show and share ev all of their secrets that they would normally charge like major consulting fees or wouldn't even meet with you. So, I, I mean, the, the number of like best selling authors and top, top performing entrepreneurs and all these things like that are just really cool people that they just don't, they don't, they, at the time they didn't have a platform or a way to share. So they were like, yeah, I'll come on your show and share it. Like yeah. I never could have picked up the phone and said, Hey, Tim Ferriss, can you, can I ask you 30 minutes worth of questions? Like never. Never, <laughs> but he, but then, but he no reached months. out to me, like yeah. his, his team reached out to me and said, Hey, Tim, Tim's got his new book coming out. He'd love to do be on your show as part of his book tour. And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to talk to one of my all time mentors and like, <laughs> see about getting him on the show. Yes. Yes. Whatever. I would, I would have loved to see the behind the scenes on that phone call. You know, as soon as you hung up, uh, what happened the after that would have been. Yeah. Incredible. Like, yes. uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, the random curveball in it is about a week before I had gotten a cease and desist from his legal team. Uh, and, but totally unrelated, like my other business was doing something like we were just getting a, we were getting a cookbook made and, uh, and he was, so we were using a term that he used in one of his like blog posts. And then he was coming out with the four hour chef, which he was starting to use some of his own terms. So they were just doing their IP, IP protection, right. Yeah. They were just doing normal stuff, but like the timing and the, uh, the <laughs> irony of like, Hey, cease and desist. And Hey, we'd love to be on your show. And I'm like, okay. Oh, Two worlds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, such a contradicting image in there. It's like, which one oh, do yeah. we go? But I bet it, it was amazing. And what year did, did you interview him? 
uh, I think that was 2013. So about two years there. after, like three years after reading his book, two years after you started your podcast, you get yeah. the chance to connect with him. Wow, that yep. is amazing. Yeah, I mean, for, for us, it was very similar with Todd Brown. Uh, you oh, know, cool. Yeah, and he was episode 40, right? And, and there's there's he's probably going to come back a second time. And, uh, you know, so many people, right? Like, what's the opportunity to be able to have that conversation with people like him, people like you, right? And I, and I think that shows the power of that platform. And then what you do after, right? It, it, it can tie down to your personal life mm -hmm. on the relationship side. It could tie down to the business side if it, there's a mutual beneficial opportunity there for, for everybody involved. Uh, so there's so much there to unpack. And I highly encourage people to start, you know, putting their message out there, like remove the friction that like we talked with Tyler here. He does it very well in his business. He identify exactly what he's really good at. Uh, he's willing to take risks, right? And and these are all the things that we talk about content and, and to put it out there, right? Like there's a reason we do we use certain tools to remove the friction. Like that's why we use StreamYard. It's very simple to use. We were trying Ecamm Live earlier and it did not work. Yep. So we're like, let's <laughs> go back to StreamYard, right? Like remove the friction for execution. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do have a, a question that, that just popped in my head, right? Because Again, sure. we were talking about how this past year you focus in, in your agency side of things and your superpower is going from zero to 100K per month, right? Of course, you are more into the, the e-commerce side of things, but I'm guessing with the agency, you have you know a lot of input from a lot of people that you're helping out. What is you know the, the biggest challenge maybe that is holding someone from going from zero to 100K per month, right? And again, I'm going off the topic too of what would Luis, what, what does Luis wants to learn here? And, and now I'm like, mm, I do want to yeah. learn that. <laughs> yeah, so um, if I had to like ascribe a percentage, I would say like, okay, 70% of the time it's the entrepreneur's mindset, right? And that could be a limiting belief or a false mm -hmm. ego, right? Like, I have, like, oh, I'm not willing to learn because I don't want anyone to know that I don't already know this. It's like, well, if you want to go from A to B, like you've got to admit you don't, you've never been to B yet. And yeah. so why don't you talk to someone that's already been there and like, it's, and have some humility. So, yep. the, it, or the limiting belief of I'm not, I'm not capable. I don't know how to do it. Right. I would say th that double edged sword of, of mindset is probably the biggest two factors. Um, and then even sometimes there's people who are, who are humble, they're open minded, they're, they're ready to learn and they just haven't been able to find the skill or the person or the connectivity yet. That's just circumstance. And sometimes the reality is not everyone is getting the same opportunities, right? Yeah. Some people are, are born next to a guy who can be their mentor and they meet him and they know him and they're going to move faster. And that's just the reality of circumstance. Yeah. And then the very last thing I, I would say that holds people back is just uh, the, the fear of taking action. Like they just yeah. aren't doing it. Like, and so you, you look at a lot of businesses that say they want to grow, but then you, then you ask them, well, what are they doing to grow? And they're like, nothing and yeah. like it's like well then you don't want to grow you want the results but you don't want to go through the pain of getting there I and mean, you guys are athletes right it's like hey you're not gonna you're not gonna become like a top scoring striker if you never train right yeah. so like you got to go get on the pitch and train absolutely uh, first of all i appreciate you putting it in in soccer terms that means a lot <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, I, 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 I was an athlete right now. I'm more like the ball. So I, I'm about to roll down the field instead of like running on the field. But that's okay. It just serves as motivation for me. You know, people that follow us know the story. It's okay. We don't have to go there. Uh, <laughs> we, no. we, we hey, you could be big and popular like Barca and about to go bankrupt. So yeah, I, I, Don't remind me. That's my team, man. Come on. Uh, it's uh, I, lo I love how... It, it, don't, don't talk about Arsenal. Yeah, yeah this, is that's, that's to, this is going to okay. be a, another episode. Part two, sorry, the, the sports section of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, so Tyler, how do you? Okay, I, I love it. I love the the mindset. I especially love the ego side of it. I think we're so tied to to that. And personally, I think people are starting to realize more, and there's been more conversations about that. I do think uh, there's a lot of resistance into that because a lot of people that start from zero. I feel they have the belief that it's all about tactic, tactics and strategies, right? And honestly, like, that was me, honestly. And I'm sure my brother, a, a little bit less than me probably, but uh, four years ago when we were starting and we had the sticker company and the t-shirt company, and then we started the digital marketing agency, <laughs> I was like, what are the strategies to make all these sales? How can I sit in the couch 
eating <laughs> chips in my underwear and make a bunch of money, right? And it turns out it is it's definitely not like that. The, now I'd like to talk more about principles, right? These principles of success. And definitely the mindset comes into those principles. What have you noticed that have been those principles for you inside of your business that have guided you to where you are right now? In the end, bad traffic uh, will convert if the offer is great. Amazing traffic hmm. won't convert on a crappy offer. So in the end, you have to make something or provide a service that people actually want. That's number one. Make something amazing. Quit mm -hmm. doing crappy stuff. Like make whatever you're doing amazing. Start there and then work backwards about, okay, now how do I get this in front of the people that, that need to see it? Yeah. And that can be done a million different ways. But like, I think sometimes people are like, and I, I made the mistake early on in my e-com business. I need more traffic. I need more traffic. And I'm like, man, what if I could just double my conversions? Like I'm already getting people to the site. What if I just made the product yeah. better? Mm -hmm. Like what if, what if I made the experience better? What if, what if I had people buying again because it was such a great experience, right? And I, and I think sometimes people skip that and they're just like, I need traffic. I just need face, Facebook needs to send me all their traffic. And I'm like, well, they may not let you even run an ad on their platform. So make sure yeah. the product's good enough that wherever you do get traffic from, it's going to be good. Absolutely. I, I, I want to relay that to content because in here, when we're creating content, that is the offer, right? This is a product that, and a lot of people, our perception was that if the production was amazing, we had a quality piece of content. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. Like I, I'm sure a lot of people have been victims in here of watching this amazingly <laughs> produced video that lasts maybe eight minutes and a minute in, you're like, oh, I'm done with it. Like next video, I don't really care about it. And it's yeah, because- it didn't, it didn't matter that the sound quality was good, that the color lighting was right. It didn't matter because yeah. the person was saying garbage. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep. And, and that's what happened to us at first. We're like, we just need that quality was that exterior mm. thing. And when we started 45 Live, I'm bringing it back again. <laughs> the way what we started telling ourselves was quality of the message over quality of the production. I mean, how yep. many webinars have I sit through and watch a talking head for an hour, hour and a half, right? I'm like, that's a piece of quality content right there is delivering a lot of value and is keeping my attention for a long time. And then a lot of the times I was buying right after. <laughs> so if we Good. approach right content with the same principle that you just talked about, right? Do amazing stuff, stuff that people really want to either consume or be a part of. That is a starting point. That is a great, great yeah. starting point. So, and I love how we had George Brand in, in the, um, in the in the show and he was telling us like every time i write, a, write an email i ask myself <laughs> the question would i send this to my grandma and i was like that is such a good question like would i send yeah. this episode to my grandma absolutely we, we would absolutely. They, they wouldn't understand a word because they don't know english but it's fine it's still good <laughs> i will still send it uh yeah i will i would take that as your action point um tyler like do amazing stuff right and, and and reiterate and listen to your audience and go back and be like how can i make this more amazing so people can buy more from it right like that that's yeah. the reasons of of why yeah. we offer a service and, and people keep coming back month after month right like we we really focus on that experience and then after that you can really focus on that so i i love that yeah. unless you want to add something else to to something no, i i just i want to be clear because i feel like in one breath i said it's just important to start like don't wait to be perfect to start and then the other breath i'm saying but but, but be amazing and that can create a little bit of like a mm. stress point for the people who are not good starters and i think it's important to understand the direction has to be towards amazing yeah like you have to start you won't ever get to amazing you won't get to great content if you don't start learning how to tell stories or start or just even practice so it's like yeah. the way i always tell people is like hey treat the first round as like a beta like hey this is a practice run Right. Yeah. And, but just do it and then be like, okay, but my goal is down the road is I know that it needs to become amazing. Like, so don't, don't create such a big hurdle, right? Remove the friction, <laughs> get into momentum. Don't, don't create such a big hurdle that has to be perfect. Yeah. But just know that it can't, like, you might suck at your message. Like, you might suck at the delivery of the story, but the message and the intention has to be amazing.
Yeah. Thank, mm, thanks for well. clarifying that. I mean, you, you would have seen the first episodes that we did. It was literally in that corner right there with like this little table and it was just the camera in our faces. Obviously, the show has evolved and it will continue to evolve. But if we didn't do that, then we would not have a show, right? Or or do the awesome things yeah. and the connections that, that we have now. We, so we, Actually, with our second guest, we had like so many technical oh, issues. Yeah. It was so <laughs> bad, but we're like... We're still doing it, <laughs> and I, I, I still to this day don't know how that gets yeah, thank you, throughout the, the conversation <laughs> with us. It, it was amazing. Uh, Be, before you deliver the, the final ninja push. question, yeah, Tyler, <laughs> I, I'm curious, do you have any specific or favorite questions that you ask your, your guests when you, when you look, when you have them on, on your show? So I have a starting question and an ending question. Which one do you want? Oh, give, give them both of them. You know, we're here to learn it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the first, the, my starting question is always, when was that moment that you first realized you were an entrepreneur? Mm. Right? So am I asking myself or am I asking it to you? Well, no, I, I was going to ask it to you, but you told us okay. that it was when you were... You already know, five years old. I yeah, didn't five see years the world. Old. And I didn't realize it then, but I realized later, I just don't see the world like my siblings or my parents. I, I see the world differently. Yeah. Um, and then the second question is that I ask after I end the show and then I come back for like a secret question and all of those answers, including like Alex from Mosey and everything are available only through a, a really small subscription fee that uh, is launching where, next month. So where, oh, sweet. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You, you, we're going to definitely plug this in. So tell us the question and then we'll plug it in. Yeah. So the question then I say, okay, imagine that you're sitting down with your best friend and, uh, and they're just at a really dark spot of their life. They're feeling super stuck. And what is that one piece of advice that's going to help get them back into momentum? Um, and so, and, and I ask that because I think sometimes our, a lot of our advice comes from a place of when we're in momentum or where things are good or we're talking about from where we are now instead of, it's easy to talk when, we're in, when things are going well, right? Yeah. But if we put our, ourselves back into that state of like when we were in despair and or when things were t really, ch really tough, that's where a lot of people are coming to us needing guidance is when it's not going great. And so um, for me, the answer to that question is like, okay, like step one is eliminate. Eliminate, like it actually, I'm going to go back to four hour work week. Step one is define. What is it that you actually want out of life? Yeah. Strip away what your parents told you you needed to be. Strip away what your spouse thinks you're supposed to do. Strip away what, you, what you've identified yourself as for the last 30 years or whatever. Like mm -hmm. what is it that you want, right? Then eliminate everything that doesn't support that. Okay. And once you've eliminated like anything that's going to pull you away from that dream, then you can say, okay, like I'm left with the things that can get me back in, into a place where I want to actually be. What is the life I want? What, is, what am I defining for myself? And then like, you've got to then create ways like in, in, in for our work week, the next step is a automate and liberate. Like how do I put things in an automated path so that I can, I'm more likely to get to my goal. And that's, you know, all kinds of little things, but that, that's what I would do. I'd say step one, define what it is to you even want. Cause otherwise we get in this horrible feedback loop of being stuck in just persisting of survival, like mm, instead yeah. of ever moving to thrive, like we shouldn't stay in survival mode. Like we're, this is 2021. We're supposed to like be doing things better. So shake yeah. off the caveman, right? And like, let's live a life of luxury if that's what you want, like figure it out. So mm. that's, but that's my answer. I love it, Tyler. <laughs> and you know what? You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking that we should actually cut this part off right here. And I'm going to put in a segment. Guys, if you want to hear Tyler's answer to this question, you should go to. And then, Tyler, where should they go? Where are we sending them? Yeah, so it'll be from TylerJorgensen.com. I'll have a place there where people can sign up and, uh, and get all of those. All of those secret questions from about over 150 guests. Wow. Oh, that's going to be that's so, so amazing. But like we said here on the show, so juicy, so good. There we go. <laughs> so juicy. I like it. <laughs> Let's yeah. go. So, Tyler, I'm going to do that. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm actually going to chop this, your question and I'm going to send it to you so you can, you can put it in there. I mean, it, it's still here in, in Facebook Live for those that, you know, are, are willing cool. to come in here, dig into the archives and check <laughs> it out. But we'll, yeah. we'll do that for the podcast. It'll be fun. Tyler, last question. Uh, this is our last question is, where will you be if you did not publish? Uh, you know, I wouldn't be doing this kind of cool stuff because you never would. I wouldn't have connected with you and, and that sort of thing. I think the biggest thing, the biggest impact that publishing has done for me is uh, consistently help me find my voice. Mm. Right? Like it's, it's having conversations like this where you say something that gives yourself chills. You're like, oh, crap. 
that's like one of my banner moments. Like that's, I need to say that more and communicate that more. And so I think uh, that's one of the reasons I like Clubhouse. I think a lot of people that don't have their own platforms can have, get on stage and practice. And you've got to get your reps in if you want to, if you want to figure out what it, what you're, you know, you got to find your voice. So I think that's the big thing it's helped me. Wow. Th- wow. Thank you so much for that yeah. answer. It's Thank exactly you. the same that the same effect that it's been mm. having on us. Uh, are you sleeping? Are you sleeping with Clubhouse? Are you able to sleep? <laughs> I recently uh, have found <laughs> I've minimized my notifications. I even like turned them off for a week uh, yeah. because I love it. But like there's a lot going on. And so it's <laughs> it's not my highest priority. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you've got to yeah. hey, like in your life, right? You got to define what you need and eliminate things that don't support. Be deliberate, right? Beautiful. Yeah, t- take action, execute, you know, remove friction and continue to do it. Dude, Tyler, thank you so much for your time, your amazing uh, answers and a great conversation. Yeah. I hope it was great for you too. Anything that you want to add that we might have missed? No, I just, my big call to action right now, it's 2021 going into this year. Just realize like whatever it is that you want to achieve, know that that's possible and more. Go after it. Chase your dreams. Like, be crazy like be, don't be afraid of risk attack yeah. it yeah yeah all right guys on that note thank you so much thank you so much for tuning into the contents profit podcast go ahead and subscribe hit smash that subscribe button and follow us on social media at base bros go that is right and if you find this episode impactful and you want to be a ninja just like tyler please don't forget to share it and and leave a five-star review thank you bye guys All right, we're still live <laughs> on Facebook, Tyler. Awesome. Yeah, Tyler. I'm like, we're still live. I'm not like, I'm like, I'm not saying. No, no, no. <laughs> <We're still laughs> we have a small tradition here. Before we head out, we're gonna take a quick selfie, meaning screenshot. So, Facebook people, smile with us. <laughs> and uh, hold on, let me let me figure this one out. One, uh, one, two, and three. All uh, right. So, all right, Facebook. <laughs> we'll see you Friday. Take see care, you Facebook. Thank you.